A little more than 48 hours ago, Peter Beck released some new information about his Neutron rocket with a great deal of fanfare, describing it as the rocket of 2050. However, all of the press that's come out since then describes this rocket as really just being an answer to the Falcon 9, the ultimate competitor to the Falcon 9, which really doesn't sound like the rocket of 2050 to me. Instead, it sounds like a rocket that's going for very conservative objectives, very low payloads, and really not what Starship is at all, which is supposed to be the rocket of the future according to Elon Musk, a rocket that lifts tremendous amounts of weight not only to low Earth orbit, but far beyond, whereas Neutron lifts a mere 8 metric tons to low Earth orbit, 15 metric tons in the fully expendable mode. So what exactly makes this rocket the rocket of 2050 when it's only really supposed to be competition for the Falcon 9? Well, I think Peter Beck has a lot more in mind for this rocket than just competing with the Falcon 9. If that's all it's supposed to do, then by the time it comes out, it's already going to be outdated. But really, this rocket has a lot more potential than just that. So yesterday, I was in a great hurry to come out with a video just explaining the Neutron and its capabilities and how it would stack up against other rockets and that sort of thing, and I found myself wondering, am I really doing justice to this thing? Just talking about 8 metric tons to orbit for the minimal amount of cost, maximum amount of reusability, that sort of thing, is that all that Peter Beck has in mind, or is this based on his view of the future, something very different than what Elon Musk has in mind. I think that really, Peter Beck thinks the future is going to be something entirely different than what Elon thinks it's going to be. Is that a bad thing? No, I think that this encourages innovation of a different kind, something that really deserves a second look. So I started to rack my brain as to unique types of applications that the Neutron could be used for that the Starship would be ill-suited to, and I started coming up with quite a few ideas and started to get a lot more excited as time went on. Ever since the development of the first Electron rocket, Peter Beck's business model has been based on the idea of less is more. In the age of micro-miniaturization, who needs to carry up giant satellites? In the age of inflatable space station modules, who needs to carry up giant heavy space stations? In the age of transporting small numbers of people to small space stations in low Earth orbit, who needs large crew capacities? And that, I think, is what Neutron is all about. My name is Jordan Wright. I was born in the same year that the human race took its first steps on the surface of another world, and then we promptly betrayed those people's legacy by never going back. But now, over half a century later, there's a new breed of pioneers that are seeking to finish what these people set out to do so long ago. But there is trouble as well. Corrupt contractors who are looking to take advantage of one of the most underfunded departments of the U.S. government and an unsustainable plan that is doomed to cancellation, as the Apollo project was. Something has to change, so it's time for commentators like me to stop being polite and start getting angry.
Now, there's probably been two dozen videos released about the capabilities of Neutron since this video first came out, but still I think I would be doing you guys a disservice to not at least talk about it. Unlike Falcon 9, this rocket is bigger at the base than it is at the top, 7 meters in diameter, whereas the Falcon 9 is only 3.7, and this is because it has fixed landing legs as opposed to retractable landing legs, giving it not only a more secure base to land on, but also better wind resistance when it's re-entering, therefore having to use less fuel to decelerate. Also, it has a second stage that is not really directly connected, but rather hangs inside the first stage with a single engine. So it has a lot of design differences from the Falcon 9, and the second stage is also extremely light. It's designed to be expendable currently, but I can guarantee you that this second stage will ultimately be reusable just as the upper stage on the Vulcan is. As a matter of fact, Rocket Lab recently received a sizable sum from the U.S. Space Force to design an advanced second stage along these lines, so the whole expendability thing is going to be short term. But the whole idea of nesting the second stage inside the entire rocket rather than making it a separate piece of the upper stage, I think is sheer genius, especially considering that the fairings are actually attached to the first stage and not the second, therefore allowing the fairing to be completely reusable. It also has a five meter internal, internal fairing diameter, which is a little bit larger than the Falcon 9 and also fits a number of applications better than Falcon 9 does. You'll notice that I'm making comparisons with Falcon 9 right now, but I'm eventually going to move on from that topic. Now, another thing everybody is talking about is materials, obviously, because Peter Beck threw some shade at SpaceX about the whole stainless steel thing, demonstrating how it's not going to hold up to impacts very well. Not that impacts are really a frequent occurrence when you're going to low Earth orbit, although with what the Russians did recently, who knows? But I think what he's trying to emphasize is that the materials of the future are carbon fiber, and he's also emphasizing that Rocket Lab does a better job at mass producing carbon fiber than just about anybody else. And given the number of electrons that this company churns out at such a low price, I think he has a powerful argument to be made. In addition to that, it does make a difference as far as mass is concerned. Even though Neutron is 7 meters in diameter at the base as opposed to 3.7 for the Falcon 9, it weighs 69,000 kilograms less. Now that makes a substantial difference as far as the thrust it requires to get it to low Earth orbit, the amount of energy it requires, and the amount of work that the engines have to do in order to achieve orbit. And this is another point that Peter Beck made. He's not trying to get engines that perform at 105 or 109 percent of capacity, but rather underperform. In other words, don't tack themselves and so therefore will be more reusable, will last longer, and with a very lightweight rocket you can accomplish this. Now, the initial thrust of seven Archimedes engines is actually substantially less than that of the nine Merlin engines of the Falcon 9. However, in the second stage, one Archimedes engine actually substantially outperforms the Merlin at 1.1 million newtons as opposed to 980,000 newtons or so. And given the fact that the second stage is much, much lighter than the Falcon 9 second stage, this this gives capacity as far as multiple uses in orbit once it achieves that. That's why I think this second stage is ultimately going to be reusable as a tug or something along those lines. So let's get into some of the applications here. Some of the obvious applica applications, of course, are constellations of small sats and that sort of thing, the thing that Rocket Lab is famous for. But he's also talked about interplanetary travel and even human space travel. 
travel. But before we get into that, I want to talk about something that Rocket Lab did not discuss in this presentation, and that is cleaning up low Earth orbit with a recent partnership that they formed with Astroscale. And by the way, I'm trying something different now. I'm introducing a new subtopic that's going to reoccur a lot in my videos, crisis in LEO, because as far as I'm concerned, this is a situation that needs to be talked about over and over again, because after this disastrous Russian anti-sat test, the situation in low Earth orbit has become a crisis indeed. Peter Beck has obviously realized that his plans to establish small sat constellations in low Earth orbit, and indeed his whole business model isn't going to amount to a pile of dog sh** unless he could proceeds with cleaning up low Earth orbit, and this, re this recent partnership with Astroscale is going to accomplish this, or at least hopefully it will in time, and the Neutron is ideally set up to do this. Let me explain how. Now, some of you may be sick of hearing about Astroscale, but I believe that this is the company that is the most likely to be able to take care of our problems in low Earth orbit as quickly as possible, simply because it already has a functioning prototype in orbit that has recaptured a client satellite. It works. It's functional and ready for mass production. This satellite is 660 millimeters by 640 millimeters by by 1.1 meters as far as its dimensions are concerned. Even with the relatively small fairing and the light payload capacity of the Neutron, at least when you're comparing it to other rockets, the Neutron would be able to carry 45 of these into low Earth orbit, potentially removing as much as 400 pieces of space junk. Now, if you do this strategically, that allows you to avoid eight potential collisions. Most of the people who study this have concluded that if you remove 50 pieces of strategic space junk, you're going to remove the possibility of one collision, which means one neutron, a reusable neutron, would be able to deploy enough of these to avoid quite a number of collisions. Now think of what 10 neutrons could do. Then you'd be looking at thousands of pieces of space junk removed rather than hundreds, and 10 neutron launches would not be a very expensive undertaking, substantially less than the launch of one SLS. Now, Peter Beck has not talked a hell of a lot about launch costs up to this point, but I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that it's going to cost five times as much as the Electron, or $35 million per launch. In my opinion, that's going to make it a very, very competitive rocket to just about anything out there. Why do I say this, given that it only has this 8 metric ton capacity? Well, Peter Beck analyzed the market and came to the realization that the average payload that's being sent into orbit these days is only 8 metric tons. That's right, even though the Falcon 9 is capable of carrying a whole lot more, the average mass that's being sent into low Earth orbit in this day and age is only 8 metric tons. And given that technology is becoming smaller and lighter rather than bigger and heavier, he's gambling that this weight requirement is going to go down, and that 8 metric tons is about all you're going to need for the vast majority of companies and the vast majority of launch providers. If he's right about this, that means the Neutron could dominate the vast majority of the entire market, not just small sats. And why am I estimating such a low cost per launch? Well, it's because of how small the cost is per launch, first of all, for the Electron, which is also comprised of carbon composites, but also it's because so much of the Neutron is reusable. Only that tiny second stage is lost, and as you can see, the vast majority of the rocket, including those giant fairings, which a lot of you guys have found to be very familiar as of late, 
are all recovered. Really, the only thing that is, quote, lost, unquote, is that second stage. And in my opinion, that second stage is going to be able to carry out secondary missions after the first launch anyway. And so launch costs may come down even further, perhaps 25 million or 20 million per launch, capable of doing things like that Astroscale mission that I talked about for a ridiculously low price compared to what's available today. Now, if Starship can launch for $2 million per launch, then it should kill everything, right? Well, in my opinion, Starship is never going to be launching for $2 million. Never, ever. The whole development cost of Starship is never going to be recouped at a rate of $2 million per launch. I think that SpaceX is going to have to charge anywhere from $75 to $100 million per launch to make Starship viable. And even at that price point, Starship is going to be very, very attractive to many customers. The kinds of customers that want to put 100 tons worth of mass on the moon, for example, or to SpaceX themselves as far as deploying huge numbers of Starlink satellites. Starship is going to be the only vessel capable of doing that, and therefore the only vessel, vessel rather capable of delivering the enormous amount of revenue that Starlink is supposed to deliver on the level of $50 billion a year. If SpaceX can manage to do that with Starship, it really doesn't matter if the market has any other use for it. Starlink alone will pay for everything that Elon wants to accomplish on Mars and anywhere else in the solar system, whereas Neutron is going to be able to accomplish a lot of what the market currently wants and will want in low Earth orbit and indeed even interplanetary as far as probes are concerned. Even as far as manned spaceflight is concerned, the Neutron has some unique capabilities. For example, the Neutron would have the capability to launch the Chinese Shenzhou spacecraft into low Earth orbit. The Shenzhou weighs under 8 metric tons, only has a diameter of 2.8 meters and a length of 9.25 meters. It would fit inside the Neutron's fairings. Now, the Shenzhou is not a very comfortable way to reach orbit, but it can carry three astronauts. And if the Neutron was capable of delivering three astronauts to low Earth orbit for $35 million, that means each astronaut would only have to foot a bill of a little over $10 million to go to one of many developing private space stations, a far lower cost than going on the Crew Dragon. This would also make spaceflight into orbit accessible for people who are admittedly rich, but not ridiculously rich. Now, I'm not suggesting that Rocket Lab partner up with the Communist Chinese. What I'm suggesting is what's possible with only 8 metric tons as far as manned spaceflight is concerned. It's obviously possible to build a spacecraft that could work with the Neutron that could carry three astronauts to low Earth orbit for a far lower price than Crew Dragon. If you could do that, then you might be getting a lot more interest from private citizens than you you're currently having where private citizens are paying 10 million or 20 million dollars to ride on friggin new shepherd as opposed to the experience of going into orbit granted it wouldn't be comfortable to go up to orbit in such a tiny spacecraft but once private space stations are in place the whole thing becomes a lot more affordable and space economy starts becoming more and more accessible and speaking of private space stations, the Neutron might prove to be an ideal launch provider in order to deliver these sorts of things as well, especially when it comes to inflatable space stations, because these things tend to have a very low mass to volume ratio. As a matter of fact, the module that's currently attached to the ISS only weighs one and a half metric tons, which means you could theoretically deploy as 
many as four or five of these modules with one neutron launch. Think of how quickly you could build private space stations for such a low and affordable cost in low Earth orbit using something as humble as the neutron. Really, the possibilities are endless, far more extensive than just the idea of delivering mega constellations. And even modules like the Axiom space modules could be designed to come in at eight metric tons as well. So you could deliver space station modules, perhaps for as little as $35 million a piece. Consequently, the launch costs of getting private space stations into orbit would become insignificant. The manufacturing portion would be the expensive part, whereas delivering a multi-module space station such as this one, which is an idea of what Axiom would like to one day expand into, a station that's actually substantially larger than the ISS, that's something that could be deployed in no time at all by the Neutron and for a very affordable cost. And by the way, if you think a 1.5 metric ton probe to Mars or Venus sounds kind of pathetic, I would remind you that the New Horizons probe that accomplished so much at Pluto weighed one third that at launch. Yes, you could launch three New Horizon probes inside a neutron and get them all to Venus or all to Mars. The capabilities of this rocket are rather stunning, and the fact that it is so much of it is reusable is going to bring the cost way down, especially considering how efficiently and how inexpensively Rocket Lab can produce carbon fiber. I believe that this is indeed a rocket that's suitable for 2050 a rocket that's going to take care of many customer needs, certainly not all of them. Starship is definitely the vehicle to carry the human race throughout the solar system and bases and habitats capable of supporting the human race. But as far as other needs are concerned, including human spaceflight, including private space stations, the Neutron can take care of it all at a cost lower than anything we've seen up to this point point. I think it's something to be very excited about and something that other companies need to keep a close eye on. If you like what I have to say, if you enjoy this type of content, you know how to support me. It's all in the description and I would really appreciate that. Or just a like and subscribe because I certainly want to get to that 90,000 subscriber mark where I can finally blow up those Boeing and Blue Origin coffee cups. So un until the Neutron is ready for flight and we can actually see what Rocket Lab is really capable of, I urge all of you to stay angry about space! <laughs>